Hello everybody, welcome. Welcome to another live stream. Let me just check that everything is working. Hopefully we've got audio and hopefully we've got some music. Oh, it doesn't look like we've got music. Oh dear. Okay, there'll be no music in this stream. <laughs> Never mind. One second, everybody. Oh, once again, we're starting off with technical issues. In case you're wondering about what's happened, my music player crashed and is not being helpful. Right, never mind, we'll start anyway. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to a Millinery Studio live stream. My name is Ilona, I'm a milliner based in London, and today I'm going to be talking all about my vintage hat collection. So my plan for today was to show you some of the vintage hats that I've got and go through some of the materials that were used, um, maybe talk about some materials that were used then but are unavailable today, talk a bit about the reasons behind some of those materials not being available, or um, just my speculative thoughts on why the materials aren't available. And I should really preface this live stream by saying that I am not a qualified historian. My highest history qualification is a GCSE, which I got at the age of 16. So that was um, about 10 years ago. So I'm not a historian. I don't know all the facts. And so this is going to be a bit of uh, more of a kind of speculation about what I think was happening in the minds of milliners at the time these hats were made. And we'll then kind of talk a bit about how those kind of vintage principles can apply to modern hat making and why they're still very, very relevant and also very interesting techniques. Um, hello, everybody in the chat. As usual, please chat to me. That's what the live streams are for. So if you'd like to um, just type away messages in the chat, I will try not to miss them and say hello to everyone. Hi, Angelus. It's lovely to see you. Thank you for catching the live stream. Um, and um, hello baby1971, greetings from Finland to all hat lovers, hello. I think you might be my first one and only Finnish viewer. Um, apologies if that's not true, but isn't that fun? I love how I'm reaching people throughout all of the world. <laughs> this, is, this is really fun. Um, Right, I guess I should make a start. And as usual, at the beginning of a live stream, I like to tell you a little bit about what I've done in the past week. Um, I think it's interesting for you guys to see how um, millinery studio work happens, but also it keeps me a little bit more accountable to all the things that I need to do, or things that I have done and things that I need to get done in the following weeks and follow up on things. Um, hi Michael, lovely to see you there again. Michael says, Hi Alona, I followed your open top pillbox tutorial on Friday and wore the hat this morning. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad. Did you go for the for a bright pink colour or what was your colour of choice? I'd love to know. Um, Megan says, tuning in from Tacoma, WA, USA. Hello. <laughs> I know I have quite a large American audience and um, that's great. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I don't know what the time difference is, but um, thank you. <laughs> um, right, let me show you from last week's live stream. If I switch the camera view, we'll be able to see a little bit. Oh, that's my, that's my tea mug. I'm drinking green tea today. This is one of my favourite mugs, it's my Ubuntu mug. Or rather, it's my husband's Ubuntu mug, but I love it because it's orange. <laughs> oh, oh, my, uh, Michael says, you did a light pink linen. Ooh, very nice. Did that drape well, the linen? Um, Louisa says, good day, Alona from New York. Love all your videos, you have taught me so much. Thank you. Oh, that's so lovely to hear. Thank you for joining us. 
for, well, for joining me. Well, when I say us, um, if you don't know who us are, it's me, um, Drusilla, my um, eight-month-old kitten, who is currently snoozling somewhere in this room around me, and also my wonderful husband, Matthew, who is the moderator in the chat. So that's that's our little studio setup here for the live streams. So I have my emotional support in my fluffy kitten, and I have my tech support in the form of my husband. Um, and actually, my husband was very lovely this week. I promise you guys, this is hat related. I um, My husband just got me a present for no reason. Look at what he got me. Aren't these cute? Let me zoom in. These are little tape measures. So you can open them up and they hold, they hold the number on the tape measure, which is really useful. And then you press the button and they go back in. I just wanted to show you guys because my husband was lovely to me this week. I mean, my husband's always lovely to me, but this was especially a lovely surprise and got me two little tape measures. <laughs> anyway, I'll stop playing with the tape measures. Let's get on to the hats. We should talk about hats. So if anyone remembers in the last live stream, I was talking about um, how I managed to get my hands on some vintage blocking net. And I, I, I still don't know whether, you know, what decade it was from, but it's 20th century blocking net. Definitely no earlier than the 50s, but I hypothesize that it's probably from the 80s. Um, but it's, it's this kind of lovely stuff that's got a hexagonal weave and it looks a little bit like tulle, but it's not tulle because it's covered in some kind of sticky, starchy substance that makes it slightly harder and when you block it, it holds its shape. And in the last stream, I tried to block it in a single layer and it's very fragile and it ripped. If you guys can see that rip there. And um, there's another rip over here. And also it really doesn't hold its shape very well. But um, once the cameras were off and it's a little bit, it's, it's quite pressurizing to try and block on stream live for the first time and things go wrong. But you know what, it's good for you guys to see that um, I get things wrong all the time, but when the camera wasn't on, I went back and I thought I'll try again because I have so much of this blocking net, it would be a shame to not figure out how to use it. And I managed it. Here is a blocked crown ready to be turned into a turban. Well, not quite ready. It needs a it needs an edge binding on the edge in the blocking net. I haven't done that yet. That's something I need to do <laughs> for next week. Um, but the way I got this going was I um, I think I sprayed a lot more water on it so it was a bit more pliable because during the stream I didn't want to get it too damp because I thought if it was too damp then I would rip it. Turns out it's the opposite with this vintage blocking net. The wetter it is, the stronger it is and the less it rips and I think that's probably to do with the starchy paste that's covering it. So it was completely pliable. It smoothed over the block like an absolute dream and I decided that I would do it in two layers. I don't know if you can quite see that but it's it's two layers of tulle and I the way I did that I didn't block one and then another I blocked two layers in one go because I wanted to see if I could align the holes as much as I could so they're not all aligned perfectly but the majority of them are aligned so it kind of looks like one layer. Um, rather than two layers because I don't plan on lining this turban. Who's got the time to line turbans? I certainly don't. So I prefer the inside of a turban to just look nice and neat, which is one of the biggest pluses of this blocking net. So yay, <laughs> that worked. Um, so that was from the last live stream. Another thing that I've been working on during this week, and I showed you some of this on my previous live stream as well, I have been working on this style of hat, which is called an infinity hat. I, I wore this during the live stream, in fact. Um, this is called an infinity hat, a figure of eight hat, loop hat, ribbon hat, um, all the things. It's a wire frame with some pleated ribbon on it. There will be a video on this, hopefully next week. <laughs> I've just got to edit it. I've actually finished everything I need for the video now. So now it just needs to be edited, produced really well, um, I like to take really lovely shots of the finished products rotating. If you guys have seen my videos, you know this, but I take great pleasure in 
that artistic side of making the videos as well as making the hats. So that's why sometimes it takes me a little bit longer to get a video out than I would like, but I'd rather the video was close to perfect rather than just good enough. But here's the hat that I wore last time and I've played around with the technique and I made it in velvet ribbon, uh, which I will talk more about in the video. So um, hopefully you're subscribed and you've hit the notification bell so that when I do release this video, hopefully next week, you'll get notified and you can watch it straight away and find out more about these hats. Also in that video, now this is a masterpiece, if I do say so myself. So I thought about pushing that technique with the pleated ribbons and the wire frames just a little bit further and I got, are you ready for this? This. Now, if you follow me on Instagram at Bylona Millinery, you will have seen a picture of when these swirls were just flat on the table, but this is what it looks like once it's been put onto a wire structure. But don't look at that too closely. You can't look at it too closely, you'll have to wait for the video. And I'll explain everything about this hat in the video. So there's a small preview for you. <laughs> Shall we move on to all the vintage hats? <laughs> Let's start with... We're going to start with my favourite fabric in the entire world, velvet. So I'm just going to take a second to get all the velvet hats on my table. And there's quite a few. Right. First, I want to show you the hat that kind of sparked my millinery journey. This is, this is the hat that made me think I need to pursue this further. And that's this one over here. Normally I wear a hat during the live streams and I'm not during this live stream because I'm going to try on all the hats for you guys so you can see how all the shapes look. Here is one of my most favourite hats. This one isn't actually vintage. Let me explain the story behind this one. So um, I was at a vintage fair and um, there was a stall that had like really rough and kind of vintage items that were falling apart completely. So they were very cheap. And that was kind of the point of the stall. And I picked up this hat. Well, I picked up the hat that this is based on and it was being sold for really cheap because the inside of it had disintegrated, the lining had um, not disintegrated, but it had glue stains on it from the glue kind of seeping through after many, many years. And I took it home, I wore it once. In fact, I've got pictures of me wearing the vintage hat. Let me share my screen and you can see that. Oh, where have all the pictures gone? Oh dear. Where have all the pictures gone? Right now you're seeing all my stats. There we go, pictures. <sighs> Look at that. So this is what this hat looked like. Oh, you can't see it in that picture. Let me zoom in over here. That's also a very blurry picture. Let's try the next picture along. There it is. Okay, this is, this is the best picture of the vintage hat and I wish I'd taken better pictures of it. But this is the original vintage hat picture. So um, there's a couple of differences you'll notice uh, once I stop sharing my screen and show my face again. Um, the things that are missing, this loopy bow thing on the front and some detail from this decoration. I'll explain it all in a minute. But this is what the original hat looked like. And if I switch back to, there we go, switch back to looking at my face, this is my reinterpretation of the hat. So what happened was, is I wore that hat for one day out, which is the pictures that you saw, and when I took it off my head, <laughs> the lining had completely come off from inside the hat, and as I took the hat off, all the straw that was inside the hat just disintegrated and fell onto my hair, fell onto my shoulders, everything just tumbled down and I thought, uh oh, this hat needs salvaging. Now, because the structure had completely disintegrated, there was no salvaging the hat, no point in putting in a new lining or trying to stiffen it or anything like that. So I took the hat completely apart, 
to see how it was made and then I remade it into this. Now I haven't added the loop at the front because my shape is just ever so slightly different. You can see that on me, this shape goes in here, whereas the original hat did stick out a little bit more. It was more of a kind of flat edge shape just above the ears. This one isn't like that. Um, and the way this hat is constructed, now that you've seen it on my head, let's look at the inside. The way this hat is constructed is in two parts. Let's zoom out a bit. We've got a halo part, which is this bit, and we've got the back part, which was blocked on a, um, a poupe head and cut out. Now, I've made this in buckram, but the original vintage hat, which I hypothesized just looking at the shape and looking at some fashion pictures from um, vintage magazines, I think this would have been a 1940s hat, maybe mid 1940s. It wouldn't have been early 1940s because the early 1940s, I would say you were seeing more kind of fedoras and hats with small brims and things like that. But, um, and the late 1940s, you were kind of starting to go more into the 50s styles and 50s shapes of hat, which were not like this, definitely not. So everything kind of flattened out towards the 50s. But this height on the head halo effect was definitely more of a mid 40s shape, I think. Um, so that's what this is. This is blocked on a, um, like a halo block, a headband halo block. And this is, I've already said, on a, on a poopy head. Ah, the materials, that's what I was talking about. All that straw that fell down onto my hair and onto my shoulders, it wasn't actually straw. I mean, at the time I thought it was straw, but now looking back and just remembering what it looked like and what it felt like, I think it would have been a, um, millinery material called spa tree, sometimes called spa tree or just uh, spartra sometimes. And what that is, is it is it is a type of straw, but it's actually a grass called an esparto grass. Um, oh, I'm very sorry about the flashing camera there. I don't know what's going on. Um, that is a grass that grows in Spain and then it would be woven into a very um, open weave a bit like um, a, a, an open weave, a bit like buckram is, covered in a starchy paste, and then the top of it would be covered in um, like a cheesecloth or a tarlatan or muslin or just something very thin. And that's definitely what the inside of this hat was. Um, there was no salvaging it. It had a hole in the middle, all fell apart. So here is my variation of it. Oh, the other thing that's missing is these decorations here, which have aged, I think they've aged beautifully. I think back in the day, if they were polished, they would have been a kind of yellow gold, but because they've tarnished a bit, they've, um, uh, the, the gold has become a little less gold. It's become like an antique gold because that's kind of what it is. This, these decorations would now be, if this hat is indeed from the forties, this hat would now be 80 years old. So I guess that, that is almost antique now. Um, and these decorations would have been uh, uh, like embroidery gold work. So potentially with actual golden thread, which you, which you can still do today with embroidery. They do sell gold embroidery thread. That's what this would have been. Um, and what's missing is that on the original hat, these were slightly raised up on um, an insert of spa tree that was also covered in velvet and then these were on there. But because my hat is a bit smaller, I think, than the original, that's why I couldn't quite fit, fit them on. I remember trying to and it was just a bit too fiddly and a bit too difficult. So that's this one. And it's lined in two pieces as well. So it's put together in two pieces with buckram and then it's lined in two parts as well. And the join is hidden with a rouleau loop. So I think, thinking back to what I said at the beginning about what can be applied in modern millinery, well, if you've got two joins and you need to hide the stitching, why not pop a rouleau loop over the top or a ribbon or something like that and make it a design feature? And that way you don't see, you don't see the stitching, which I think is rather clever. And also I like the idea of, um, two parts to make one hat. I always say that you don't want to, you don't want to let your blocks dictate 
your creativity. You know, if you want the block to work for you, you don't want to be a slave to your block. So if you've got a block and you don't quite like it, or something's not quite right, or you've got an image of one hat in your mind and your block is, it's almost there, but not quite. Don't be afraid to cut away or to join two two bits together blocked on two separate blocks to create some kind of fantastical shape that you've got in your mind or that you've drawn down. That's absolutely fine. And that's really a great thing to do. So that's this hat. Although, um, hmm. I do also want to talk a bit about what vintage velvet was like because you cannot get velvet like it used to be. Um, we'll look at all the velvet hats and then we'll talk about types of velvet. Let's do it that way. So that was the green 1940s one. Now let's move on to this one. So this is what I was talking about with shapes in the 50s kind of being flatter. So this is an early 50s hat. It's very damaged, so and we'll talk about that in a second. So this is an early 50s hat. Um, I, I have seen this kind of hat shape called a clam hat because it kind of looks like a clam shell where you've got a, um, technically this is a brimmed hat even though it's not a brim like you would think about it. So it's got like the center crown at the top and then you've got the clam brim which kind of goes to nothing at the back and it's kind of spreading over the head at the front and there's some feather detailing on it and a few crystals and once again it's got a rouleau loop con concealing the joining stitches which is clearly something that was I mean in my two hats something that is a recurring theme and I have seen it on a few other hats as well so I think this is something that we should bring back in modern millinery. I think this is rather neat. <laughs> Switch the camera views again and have a look a bit more closely at this hat. So this hat is very dented. The purpose of this hat is not to be worn. The purpose of this hat is for research because I want to see if I can remake this shape. Um, so as I've already said, it's got the central crown and then it's got a clamshell style brim that's not a brim but it is a brim but it's not a brim and then the inside it's actually not technically lined I can't quite figure out what's going on in this hat I can't figure out what it's made out of and I can't figure out why it's made like this but it's super hard if I kind of poke the inside listen to this that is how insanely hard this hat is I mean, like, you could probably wear it on a building site and um, it can double up as a hard hat. But don't do that. Don't... that was... yes. Anyway. Um, I don't think we make heart hats this stiff anymore. Although I would be interested to see on how modern lightweight buckram would react to being in this hat shape maybe there's a reason why it's this stiff maybe be, maybe it has to be this stiff to hold this kind of shape although i wouldn't think it would have to be like that today although i'm feeling here where the join is and actually there's no wire there maybe that's why it's this stiff because if i was using modern buckram to make this shape and let's say i wanted to make it in two parts i would make the top and i would make the the brim and if I wanted to have a join there, I would potentially be looking at putting a wire there. Did I put a wire in here? Oh no, I didn't put a wire in this join, but maybe I should have done. <laughs> um, this hat is not made with a join. It's just been moulded. This would have been one of these really fast factory hats where it would have just been churned out in less than a day and then sold in a department store for relatively cheap. It hasn't got a label on the inside. I mean, maybe it did one day, but it's clearly fallen out. This was a very cheap eBay purchase that I do want to make a video on trying to remake it. So once again, you're seeing a preview on the live stream. Now the decoration, it's got a few feathers and some crystals. And they're not even good quality crystals and they're not being held on very well. And the feathers are not, uh, the feathers are glued on. You can see the glue residue under here. And that would have been probably rabbit glue in vintage hats. Yeah, no, it's 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 a lovely design, but it has not survived very well. And um, I think if I was to make a replica, 
we would see this hat in what it was intended to look like and that's something that I really like to do with vintage hats and it's something that I recommend that people do when they start learning about millinery is um, a good way to learn is by copying something but you shouldn't copy something and then uh, co copy a modern milliner and then put it for sale because that's not right because that model is currently being sold but if you've got a vintage hat around and you want to copy it and then you want to sell it I personally think that's okay because you are the only seller of that style potentially um, but that's kind of my thoughts on this hat is that I definitely want to remake it see what it's like and then just play around with it Megan says could the beige with feathers be an early use of thermoplastics would someone have done that in this case mass market potentially that would explain why I have no idea what the inside of this material is because if I zoom in even more, I mean, it's got stains on the inside. It's got everything. Um, can you see what this is? This is very weird. It's almost like all they've done. I'm just going to try and, and uh, this is going to look very funny on camera, but I'm looking at this very closely. I think there is something under this lining, I think. But my plan is to take this hat apart and have a look. At what's going on and I'm not going to do that right now um, because I th this hat has been sitting in my cupboard for over a year but I'm just not mentally ready to take it apart yet because it's quite a mammoth task to try and take it apart and preserve how it was. Um, another interesting detail actually this is something that you don't tend to normally see in hats. Um, oh also Megan in answer to your question I don't know anything about thermoplastics at all I'm not the person to ask about that so I, uh, I guess maybe <laughs> um, when I take it apart maybe I'll be able to see maybe when I take it apart I could do a burn test on it obviously in all the safety conditions with a glass of water next to me outside and if I burn the material I might be able to tell if it's a plastic or if it's a natural fiber just the way it burns away um, yeah so I think I'll definitely try that that's a good idea thank you so this is something we don't see really in hats is this is stapled on this little um bow on the back look at that can you see the staple isn't that interesting i would not have thought to do that on a modern hat it just feels like a weird yeah i can see it poking out here there's a little staple poking out there gosh it really is just... if i pull that apart there's a proper full-on staple in there that's so weird. But I mean mass market, it's probably easier to get a stapler and just go ka-ching than it is to sit there with a with a thread and just tack it down with three stitches. I mean, it, it's quick to tack things down, but it's even quicker to staple something, I guess. I probably wouldn't do that. Um, I don't think I could bring myself to do that. I can see why it would have been done. Again, it points to this being a mass market hat, but... I wouldn't if, if I was recreating this I think I'd try and recreate it in my own preferred technique which is kind of a cross between like a theatrical technique and a and a couture technique kind of a mix of both I don't I don't always go in for the full-on couture end of things because I think that's a bit too much it's very time-consuming and it doesn't for me, I don't feel the need to do that. I, I want to try and find a balance between saving time, cutting costs, but still making a very high-end product with those limitations. So that's probably what I would try and do with this hat. So it wouldn't be a an exact faithful recreation like I was trying to do with this previous green hat that I was talking about. So that's the two velvet hats. I've got two more velvet hats to talk about. I've got this one over here. That's not the velvet. That this isn't part of it. That's I'm going to explain what that is in a second. Let's just make sure we're all focused. Hopefully we're all focused. We're slightly overexposed, but hopefully you can still all see it. So, this was a um, vintage callow half hat. So on the head, it would sit like this. Um, and I'll explain why it's all taken apart in a second. And what I like about this one is it's got these fun little cut out things going forwards 
I think those are rather fun. Um, that's something that I do see a lot in vintage 50s hats is they were never just, I mean, they, there were a lot of just plain shapes, but milliners at the time seemed to have a lot of fun just blocking some spartry or some buckram on a open uh, on a plain crown block and then cutting into it making it look all interesting sometimes they're symmetrical sometimes they're all swirly and asymmetrical and it's still at the end of the day a callow half hat that just perches on the top of your head like this and i think that's a really interesting thing that we could kind of bring back and if you're struggling to start making hats because you think you need all these blocks and all this equipment and no you really don't you just need an open crown block or if you can't even afford an open crown block you can buy a 20 pound cork or polystyrene pooper head on amazon or your hardware shop anything like that and you can make hats like this it's super easy you don't need anything fancy you don't need anything expensive of course it becomes easier once you've got the fancy and expensive stuff but if you're just getting started and you want some styles you can make just get them done and and sell them then this is i think this is the way to go although some people will call this fashion old old fashioned mm, let's do a poll let's do a poll do you guys think that vintage and old fashioned are the same thing or do you guys think that you could still get a vintage hat that's um, still fashionable? Or do you think that vintage is always old fashioned and always looks outdated? Let's do a poll. Do I remember how to do a poll? Mm, so is vintage the same as old-fashioned? The answer can either be yes, vintage equals old-fashioned, or no, vintage... Oh. Vintage can be fashionable. Let's... let's ask. So if you guys would like to participate in the poll, it should pop up in the chat any minute now, hopefully. I'd love to know what you guys think. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine about this and she was saying, oh, vintage things are always old fashioned. You can't escape the fact that vintage things are old and therefore that makes them old fashioned. And I said to her, yes, but you see so many trends coming and going and vintage can be you, you can have a new and interesting spin on something that's vintage inspired, perhaps. So um, we had um, an interesting discussion last night about that. But what do you guys think? If you want to expand on the on the poll options, just uh, write something in the chat for me. I'd love to know um, about all of this. So I'll leave the poll up for a bit. But right now, everyone who has voted I think 100% of you have said that no, vintage can still be fashionable. So you guys all agree with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> that gives me some ammunition to go back to my friend and say, well, actually, the millinery community on YouTube say that. <laughs> Angela says vintage can be fashionable. Yeah, that's what I thought. Clearly not everyone thinks this way though. <laughs> While you're all still voting, I'm just going to top up my tea. Megan says, I think the half callow is a very contemporary look. Yeah, I think so too. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Here's a question for you, Megan. How would you um, style a hat like this? What kind of thing would you wear it with? Do you think you can only wear a callow half hat with like a vintage dress, kind of like I've got now? This isn't a vintage dress, but it's a, it's a vintage replica dress. Um, but do you think someone could pull off a callow half hat with like maybe um, 
jeans, a t-shirt and blazer or something like that. And like stiletto heels or something like a sleek look. Um, Shari says, to me, vintage is the finest of those eras surviving to the modern day. They are the trends of the time that become golden and classic, something that draws us in and returns us to it. Very nice. That's very well put, Shari, and very true. And Mike, uh, Michael says, a skewed sample here, since we all obviously love vintage looks. Yes, I. Th that's very true. That's not very scientific of me, is it, to ask um, people who have tuned in to a live stream about vintage hats, do you like vintage? <laughs> Oh well, I'm going to close the poll now. Where can I end the poll? There we go. <laughs> so the results will pop up in a second. <laughs> so yes, 100% of you have said no, vintage can be fashionable. <laughs> Well, thank you for boosting my ego a little bit after after my conversation with my friend yesterday. <laughs> Sonia says, I'd be totally up for a jeans and trainers look with something vintage. Ooh, yes, interesting. Very interesting. Maybe um, jeans, trainers, but like a 1940s blouse with like a little Peter Pan collar and puffy sleeves. Uh, Michael says, I tend to wear my vintage hats, hat styles with fancier outfits. Yes, I think I think a lot of people do that. I do that as well. I'm not brave enough to try vintage hat and jeans. Although, now that Sonia said jeans, trainers and vintage hat, I am keen to just maybe put it on, have a look in front of the mirror and see what that would look like. Do you know what? Actually, after the stream, right, guys, follow me on Instagram. And after the stream, I'm going to go and put on some um, Keds, my skinny jeans, and a callow half hat, and um, maybe a blouse or something. I'll have a look. I don't really have many blouses, but I'll try and throw together an outfit. And if you follow me on Instagram, have a look at my stories. I will um, try some things on <laughs> and see what that looks like and post it there. And then you can all send me messages and tell me if you think it looks awful or if it looks interesting. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the hats. So this red hat, it's completely taken apart because I wanted to restore it. So this is a vintage Calo half hat and it actually had a, um, a visor attached to it. So here is the visor attached um, and then the stitch is covered with a Petersham ribbon. So if I put that back to how it was, it was kind of like this. So you can see up in the corner of me looking small. And then it had these two kind of either side over here, these little round things, which do make it look rather interesting. And then it had a bit of veiling. Let's see if I stay very still. Here's the veiling. The veiling has completely disintegrated. So there's no salvaging the veiling but the veiling was kind of just plonked around it like this. So now if I switch camera views, hopefully this all doesn't fall off my head. Here it is. So an interesting shape, which is why I bought it. But, whoops. Um, after a few years of me wearing it, I did notice, and I, I didn't notice this before, so I don't know if I put these dents in or if these dents were there before, but there's... There's a bit of dirt on it over here. You can clearly see that on the camera amidst all the red, this black spot of whatever that is. Um, I mean, these bits are stitching marks, so I, I don't really worry about them, but it's it just doesn't look as in good condition as it could. And um, so I took it apart. Currently, these are just pins holding everything together, but inside here, this is a bit of buckram. If I pull it back, you can see it. And then it's got um, a very stiff layer of lining. So this is something that this hat has in common with this beige clamshell, is that the lining in itself is what's helping hold the structure. It's really, really stiff. Again, if I knock on it, like on a door, oh. that's me just knocking on this hat. That's how stiff it is. now. I haven't come across very many modern hats that are this stiff and it's not 
the buckram that's giving it the stiffness. It's the, the buckram is giving it structure, but this stiffness is coming from these very, very stiff linings. And I don't know what fabric this lining is. Once again, maybe I could do a burn test on it if I'm totally taking it apart, maybe, and figure out if it's cotton or what on earth it is. I mean, it's got these um, ridges through it, which I think there's a vintage fabric called Garbadine, which was used in jackets and things. Um, it could be this, because it's got a very similar te texture, but I'm not a... Um, I, I, I'm... I don't know textiles that well. I only know the basic ones, so I'm just guessing here. This could be anything, really. All I can definitely say 100% is that it's surprisingly stiffer and more rigid than you would expect it to be. Um, so that's this hat. And what I've got here is a whole load of cotton velvet, which um, I'm going to use to try and remake this hat. Um, so... I mean, this kind of brings me on nicely onto the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is vintage velvets and modern velvets and what the differences are. And this is very much a topic I'm very interested in exploring more, but I don't know where to find the right resources because the only thing I've managed to find out is that in the 40s and 50s, there was a type of velvet called Lyon velvet made in Lyon in France and it was silk on the top but it was very stiff in the backing and that's what um if we think back to the green hat that i was talking about this is the actual velvet from the original green hat and so you see how it's shiny on top right so this sheen and shine you can see from my studio lights you can see that light reflecting in the velvet in a way it doesn't in cotton so that's how I know that this is cotton velvet because can you see that it's totally matte it's like the difference between a matte lipstick and a gloss lipstick if it's matte like matte lipstick then it's cotton and if it's got a bit of shine to it, then it's probably silk, unless it's polyester, but we're ignoring polyester. Polyester does not exist in my universe. So if we assume that the top of this is silk, the backing of it, look at how stiff that is. Now it's, I don't know what the backing of this velvet is. I was thinking earlier today about what I was gonna say about these hats. And I thought maybe what it is, is that the back of this is cotton and that's why it's this stiff and the top of this is silk because in modern velvet if i show you a sample of modern silk velvet as you can see it's silk it's shiny it's reflecting the light but the back of this velvet this is viscose which is a man-made kind of bamboo uh, paper fiber um but it's it's not polyester so it's not um it's not plastic um and this velvet stretches, it drapes, it's completely floppy. Whereas the vintage silk velvet that has whatever this is as a backing is very stiff. And if I think about the way cotton um, behaves, if we think, if, if we have our dressmaking caps on for a second, if anyone is a seamstress, um, you'll probably be able to follow along here a bit better, but let me try and explain this to you. So, um, in fact, actually, we might need to employ um, husband's help. Um, husband, I need a fabric sample. <laughs> Somewhere in the flat is my purple um, kind of home cardigan that's very drapey. It might be in the room you're in or it might be hanging up on the side of the wardrobe in the bedroom, but it's a purple modal top. I'd like you to bring it if you can. Um, and then I will show you some cotton which is next to me. Let's find some cotton. There we go, perfect. Right. Oh, husband can't help today because he's been paged. Never mind, we'll have to imagine what modal looks like. Do we have to imagine it? Maybe I have some jersey. Do I have some jersey in here? No, okay, never mind. We'll have to imagine what things look like. So, this is cotton. This is definitely cotton. I've tested it. I know it's cotton. It doesn't, it, it has a bit of stretch if I force it. 
but it has it doesn't have a drape quality like something like a jersey or a modal fabric would it's it's uh, so it's a kind of knit fabric it it drapes really beautifully it's used in um kind of fancy homeware or sometimes in underwear in ladies knickers um because it's got those soft qualities and drapey qualities whereas cotton is quite stiff it's not going to have that natural stretch and i think that's kind of the difference here i mean this doesn't th this doesn't have a stretch on the grain either but it is definitely a lot more drapey than the vintage velvet and i cannot find any factory or any fabric supplier shop that sells silk velvet that is this stiff they sell cotton velvet that's stiff because it's got a cotton nap and it's got a cotton backing so like this red velvet here that's going to go onto this vintage hat this cotton it's super stiff it's stiff on the back and it's stiff on the nap side but the silk velvets the modern silk velvets they are not like that they are totally drapey they are beautiful and it, they are wonderful and if you're making a hat with drape on the top of it in this velvet it's perfect but if you're trying to get a nice flat coverage of it it becomes a little bit harder and in one of my previous videos where i was testing out some stiffeners from some pr i found that i could very carefully stiffen modern viscose velvet uh, viscose silk velvet and it becomes textured a bit more like this vintage velvet. It's, it's a bit heavier because that stiffening has added some weight to it. But if you look at the back of this, this is velvet from the same manufacturer. It's just two different colors. Oh, I can't even hold it. Here's this orange velvet that hasn't been stiffened. And here's this sea green velvet that has been stiffened. So, Eventually, when I have some time on my hands, I'm going to try and make, maybe even for when I come to remake this hat, although I'm convinced this is cotton velvet because it's not shiny, but um, maybe if I try and make a different style of hat and use some silk velvet, I might try and stiffen it with the chemical stiffener to see that, um, to see how it works. Maybe it won't work. Maybe it will just be so stiff that it won't do anything. But because this is the stiffener that I use with, um, felt hats my assumption is is that as soon as I steam it it will become pliable again and then it will um, dry and hold whatever shape it's given Sherry says do the naps of these velvets differ or is it only the backing um, you mean between the vintage velvet and the modern velvet so the nap which um, if you guys don't know what the nap is it's it's the the furry side of the velvet it's if you think of how a carpet is made where it's all loopy that's what that's what we were talking about when we say the nap so the that's usually silk and uh it, well in in these examples it's silk and that's why it's shiny just which is what makes me think that this uh vintage one is shiny and now i've got orange fibers all over it i will go and clean that later um but the back will be different depending on different manufacturers so if I can find a silk velvet that's backed in cotton, I think I would have found the right thing. But I haven't found that yet. Maybe it doesn't get produced. As with a lot of millinery materials, a lot of the time, um, things stop being produced. So just like the spa tree, which you can't get anymore, um, I think the story with that, I, I heard... Um, but again, speculation, speculation alert, wild speculation. This story has not been fact-checked. I have heard that the last factory that used to produce Spartry burnt down in a fire and they just didn't bother rebuilding it because they didn't have enough money and they weren't getting the same volume of orders so they just closed down the business and therefore we have no more Spartry in the world. I don't know if that's true. Um, if it is true, that's um, quite a shocking story. If it's not true, then it's just an interesting story of what could have happened. Um, with the blocking net, very similar things. Um, so blocking net is, is this stuff. This is vintage. But modern blocking net was being produced. 
up until COVID. And then when there were lockdowns all over the world, lots of businesses had to shut down because they just weren't making that money because they couldn't go in and use the looms that the uh, blocking net was woven on, knitted on. So blocking net is a knitted fabric. And so that shut down and there's no more blocking net that you can buy. So that's a shame. I think there is a manufacturer or there's a millinery supplier who is working on trying to set up their own manufacturing process or something like that. But um, that was about a year ago I heard about that and I've heard nothing since. So I don't know how long it's gonna take them. I Maybe they'll decide that it's just not viable for, for their business to do that because we don't have as many milliners anymore because lots of people, not very many people wear hats now as they used to. So that's a shame. Um, Michael says, I just learnt last week that the possibly only factory that makes millinery wire in the US is shutting down and possibly not reopening because of COVID and then losing their lease. Oh my goodness. Oh dear. Oh, that is not good for the millinery industry. Um, gosh, if <sighs> you can still use galvanized wire you can still use floristry wire. It won't be the same. So floristry wire tends to be covered in wax paper. Uh, galvanized wire isn't covered in anything, but it should be rust proof. You could also potentially get floristry wire imported from Japan. Um, I think that would probably be your way out of everything, but that's going to be incredibly expensive. And then the price of hats, the end product is gonna go up and then even less people will buy them. Gosh. Uh, Michael says we can still order from the UK. Oh, that's good. Good, good, good. I don't know about millinery wire production. That's something I haven't looked into. I don't know if we have factories in the UK that do it. Oh, dear. That's just depressing. I have a dream that one day I will have enough time and I will have enough money to invest into opening up a millinery dream factory where I will produce blocking net and spa tree and maybe millinery wire now. And um, one day, maybe once, <laughs> once, once I bought a house and then once I've paid off the mortgage on that house <laughs> and then I can start saving some money, then I can invest that in a millinery dream factory. Wouldn't that be wonderful? One day. So this, this is my long-term dream, which may or may not happen. But if it does happen, then I will be very grateful that I'm able to do that for millinery things. <laughs> oh dear. Should we get back to the velvet? Let's stop thinking about depressing things. So thinking back to some of these um, vintage callow half hats, I'm actually in the middle of making some for um, an order that I've had come in and this is how um, this is how buckram looks and this has been blocked into a callow half hat shape. The next step is for me to wire it. So I start off with a flattened circular wire that I've done a join in and I will bend the wire into shape, stitch it to the buckram then cover the whole thing in demet and fold the edges over and then I can decorate my shape. So that's kind of the process of how this red hat has been made and how I make some of my designs. And if you wanted to try callow half hats, that's the way to go. Sherry says, I volunteer as a worker, sign me up. Great. <laughs> I shall get back to you in 40 years. Because <laughs> I think that's how long it's gonna take me to uh, buy a house and get a mortgage. <laughs> Right, um, one last velvet hat before we move on to straw hats. So we've spoken about some vintage velvet, some modern velvets, callow half hats, and now I've got, right, this one I have to be very delicate with. So this is, uh, this is a black hat, it's black velvet, and it's the most delicate hat I own because it has almost not been refurbished at all. I apologize for the rustling of the tissue paper. I very rarely wear this. 
but I do wear it because it's not a museum piece. It is a piece of, as I like to call it, living history. It lives and it breathes and it does get worn on occasions when there is not a lot of sunlight because I don't want the velvet to fade. Um, I'm just going to take it off the tissue paper. Right, and then I will support it at all times. I'm not going to just let it drop on the table. Let me pop it on my head because it's actually safest on my head. If I, if I was blonde, you'd be able to see the design much better. But here it is. It looks a little bit weird um, just because it is a bit misshapen, but I really love this design. And this is on my list of hats to recreate so that the design itself can carry on living and then I don't have to feel bad about wearing this one so much in case it gets damaged because I know how to make it and I have backups. Now this one is also from the 1950s, late 50s I would say because again we've gone flatter but we're not quite into the 60s. Uh, we'll, we'll move into the 60s with my straw hats but still we're very much in the 50s this is late 50s, I would say. So kind of maybe, maybe 57-ish. Um, and it's velvet. And this one is also on a spa tree base. And the spa tree base in this hat has also almost completely disintegrated. I can't show you that because I relined it. If I switch cameras now and take it off my head and show you the inside. Here it is. This is a um, silk satin lining that I relined the hat with. So this is not the original lining that was in the hat. I do have the original lining somewhere. When I take apart something or refurbish a vintage hat, I always keep all the original parts because you never know if, I don't know, you might need them for something, I don't know, but I just can't bring myself to throw away bits of history. So I do have them in a box somewhere. Oh, you can actually see here a tiny bit of the spa tree poking out. Can you see that little bit of straw? That's some spa tree there. I don't want to peel this back too much, but that orange thing in the middle of the black, that's spa tree. Um, right, let me talk you through this design. So, firstly, how's the exposure on this? You guys might not be able to see it. Maybe you can see it from this angle. There's a bit of a... a a kind of drape in the shape. I imagine that this was hand molded. I don't think this would have been done on a block just because of how asymmetrical it is. It very much looks like a milliner had an idea, got her spa tree out, got her steamer out and just went like this with her hands on the block and just created magic, which is, which is what we're all in the business of doing really. <laughs> so there's this, it, it very much looks like it was hand molded and that this was one of the things that spa tree was amazing at. You could steam it, it would a kind of fold into its shape and then it would just stay there. And it was magical apparently. I've never worked with spa tree. Someone who has worked with spa tree is um, Rachel from the YouTube channel Labricalous. Um, all the details of the members of the millinery community on YouTube. We've got a little millinery community of us who are trying to propel millinery into the modern era by participating in the internet. All their links are in the description box. So if you're looking for more hat content, it's uh, it's not just me. You've got uh, Rachel from Labricolous, who is um, a kind of theatrical milliner. She teaches. Um, and she, she knows a lot about Spartry. She's got a lot of information about Spartry on her channel, so go and have a look at that. If you're looking for more information, um, that's the place to go. Uh, let's get back to the hat. Over here, this is, this is one of my favourite details of the hat. Will it show or is it too dark? I don't know if you guys can see, but this is a kind of a bumpy bit of the visor. You can see there's a little step up here. It, it's not great that it's all black because you can't see it. And this is a series, I'm just poking my nail in there to just feel what it is. It's a series of yet more rouleau loops. Here, it, here is the evidence that it is a rouleau loop. This is the rouleau loop. And then it ends just elegantly off the hat over here. Um, then it's covered in a velvet, which I imagine would have been a stiff velvet. 
I don't know if it's cotton or silk. It might actually have been cotton velvet because it's not giving that shine that a velvet would. Oh, there's a bit peeling back here. Let's have a look at the backing. Oh, actually, no, I think it is silk velvet. This feels exactly the same as the green velvet from the green hat, if we get that out again. Here's that. Oh, here's that green velvet. And it's got that stiff backing. This velvet here on the back of the flower that's peeling away feels identical. And it, I think it looks pretty much identical. I don't know if the camera will carry this onto you. Um, what I love about this flower is actually the inside of it. It's just two twigs. Look at that. The stamen for the flower. Just two twigs. Who would have thought of that? I wouldn't have thought of that. I think this is genius. Like, you don't need to go and find some fancy stamens or make your own stamens like I have done in some of my previous videos. You don't need to do that. Just pick up some twigs off the ground and stick them into the middle of your flower. Isn't that lovely? And the petal shape on this is just beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. And this is being held up with um, a stiffened, something that's been stiffened. I actually think this is stiffened linen or maybe it's stiffened straw or it's, it's something that's holding up the structure of this flower. I think it's beautiful. And then it's got these two tall leaves. Oh dear, I didn't think this through. You can't quite see it. There's a leaf that goes, okay, follow my nail. There is a leaf that is over here. And then there is a second leaf that's a little bit smaller that's over here. It has a slight jagged edge very very slight because it's velvet and it has been tooled there's three tool lines in it oh i'm very sorry that the top camera keeps cutting out i don't know what that is um so there we go that's this hat and i really want to remake it i think it would look really lovely in like a light purple um because i think with the black you lose that detail oh and here's some more detail that i missed oh you can see this on the camera you can see these reflections here it's reflecting the light these are little folds in the velvet because this velvet hasn't really been, um, I would say this velvet has kind of just been draped on. It's not been stretched, it's not been pulled, it's not tightly affixed to the structure underneath like this one, the red one. I would say this red one has just been, it, it's just the same shape as the hat underneath because it's a simple shape, it's just a callow hat. It's simple to cut that out as a flat pattern and just slightly stretch the velvet over. But this, because it's a deep um, hat, I would call this a skull cap, which skull caps were actually very popular in the 1930s. Um, but I think this one is 50s, just looking at the front of it. I don't think this is as old as the 1930s. Um, if it was from the 1930s, I think it would look, a, I, I think it would look more battered. Um, and this, this hat didn't have a label on the inside. I have no idea where it's come from. Um, one of my friend's mums um, gifted it to me because um, she knew I was into vintage and vintage hats and she saw it at a vintage fair and thought, I know I'm going to buy that for Alona and I'm very grateful for that because this is a wonderful hat that I wouldn't have necessarily bought for myself but I actually have grown to really appreciate it and really love it. So there we go with some little... I wonder if there's some drapes under here. It looks like there are. It looks like on this side, the two leaves that I mentioned earlier are covering these pleats in the velvet. But on the other side, the bow is, I think, supposed to cover them. But it's it's interesting. It's interesting that it's symmetrical and at the same time, it's not symmetrical. So if I hold it up like this, this is the front. It It's symmetrical in its shape, but the decoration is not symmetrical, which I find very interesting because... I would always reach for symmetry because that's just something that I like. Um, and even on this clamshell hat here, you can see this is symmetrically decorated. Um, the red hat from earlier, when I put the little kind of small felt discs on it while it was on my head, you could see that was symmetrically decorated. Um, this green hat over here, it's it is a symmetrical hat in itself. It's not technically symmetrically decorated, but it's still very well balanced. But this one, it's completely asymmetrically decorated because it's got the flower and leaves on one side and then the um, velvet low loop bow on the other side. 
And I would say it's not balanced at all. If you look at it from the front and you saw it on my head a moment ago, it does not look symmetrically balanced at all. And I, I think that's what makes it interesting because if you're wearing this hat and someone would probably take a double take at you as you walk down the street because it's not symmetrical. And the human eye is drawn to symmetrical things. So we kind of ignore the symmetry. But as soon as we see something asymmetrical, suddenly we go, oh, oh, what was that? Oh, it's asymmetry. Oh, <laughs> Megan says, I think I have scraps of some similar silk velvet with stiff backing from a past gar garment found in my grandmother's house in the late 70s, probably from the 40s or 30s. Interesting. You see, that's possibly a very similar velvet to what I'm talking about. Um, maybe if you find it, um, have a look at it again and see if it's similar to what I was describing with the green velvet. It, it could well be that. And if you put it in the light and it has a shine, then it's probably silk on the front. Right, I'm going to gently pop this hat away. There's nothing more to say about it. I store this one away very carefully. Right. We're about halfway through the stream and halfway through my hats. I'm going to turn on the intermission um, and take all these velvet hats off my head and uh, off my table and replace them with some straw hats. So see you guys in two minutes. Have a cup of tea, take a break.
I'm back. Oh, maybe I should have checked the camera batteries and replaced some of them because I think my top camera has run out of batteries. So maybe um, my husband can come and help me with a camera battery because I don't know where I've put them. Oh dear, they've gone somewhere. I should have checked that while I was taking a break. But um, welcome back, everybody. I have um, done a change of the guard on my table. Oh, my camera batteries are where? They were next to you, now they're gone. You put them somewhere, I think you took them to charge into the other room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my tech support is on call this weekend, so he's, uh, he's not as efficient as usual. <laughs> Thank you, my darling. <laughs> right, let me just switch the camera battery. Oh, dear. Hopefully that will now work. Yes. Wonderful. So, welcome back everybody. I hope you've had a pleasant break. I'm, uh, I'm almost running out of tea, but that's okay. We don't have much left to go. We've got two straw hats, one felt hat, and a couple of extra vintage hats on the side there, if we get round to it and have some time. Let's jump straight back in. You might remember this wonderful hat from one of my videos. Um, let me know in the chat if you know what video I'm talking about. Have you watched all my videos? <laughs> and if you haven't watched all my videos, then I highly recommend going back and um, maybe checking if you've missed some. Because, you know, just more information for you guys to learn more about millinery. So um, if you haven't guessed yet, I've given you plenty of time. This is a hat by Edna Wallace. Let me pop it on my head. This does not go with the dress I'm wearing, but I love this hat. Isn't it gorgeous? Now this one is from the 60s, late 60s, um, maybe mid 60s. People were kind of not wearing hats then, but some people were. Um, so that's when we kind of start to see a decline in millinery. Um, oh, husband's just posted a link into the chat there of this particular video. <laughs> um, so, this is a straw hat. I think it's a paracisal straw. So, if you don't know what paracisal is, sisal is the type of straw, so that's the plant. And para just means two, so double weave. So you can get a sisal hood or you can get a paracisal hood. So a sisal hood is just a single weave and a paracisal hood is a double weave. And I should have prepared some samples to show you guys, but never mind. Um, so I think this is paracisal just because it's so finely woven. And what it has is going down the front of it. These are bias strips of fabric. Um, when I found this hat online, I thought they were ribbons, but upon closer inspection, they're bias bits of fabric, and actually that makes more sense, because um, of all the curves. If you just try to um, execute this design of this hat using um, like some satin ribbons or something like that, you would not be able to get the ribbon to sit this nicely within these curves, because ribbon has no stretch, unless it's a stretchy ribbon. Whereas a bias bit of fabric, like a bias binding, it has stretch. It is able to conform to these kind of corners. So once again, that's something to think about when designing your own hats, is if you want to accentuate a curve, a detail of a curve, um, by adding some contrast to it like this, then think about using a bias piece of material rather than a ribbon, which is potentially what you'd reach for first. Let's switch camera views. And let me show you the top of it and the back of it. Isn't this gorgeous? Um, so in my video that um, Matthew has posted in the chat, I go through restoring this hat and um, it was just slightly dented. It just needed a little bit of extra TLC. It needed a little bit of extra steaming and a little bit of gluing in some places. Um, and it's, it's turned out pretty well, I think. Um, I think it looks really gorgeous. It can live on now for several more decades. So what is it? It's a kind of 
beehive bubble berry thing a kind of a bubble berry turban esque thing this is definitely blocked on a wooden hat block i think you'd struggle to freeform this yourself on an open crown block like i've mentioned with several other hats um so you can only do this on a on a block and i can't see any pinholes in these um uh ridges in it which makes me think that um maybe what was used to get that shape would have been maybe some string pulled tightly and maybe pinned into the top and then pinned into the underside to hold the the straw down to get this shape because if you started pinning into all this fine straw you'd get so many little holes and you don't want that um i mean who knows maybe this ribbon is covering a multitude of sins but i don't think so i think this has definitely been held in place with something and not pinned into so that's another way to use blocks um so i've mentioned already these bias bits of ribbon it, it is essentially bias binding look at that you can see this this kind of whole uh unfolds like that and you can see inside it's bias binding and then it's got these loopy things which i love um, so this bit of straw here, it's been machine stitched flat, so it's essentially a bit of someone's gone and turned a bit of straw into a piece of bias binding and stitched it down to the same width as the red. I think this is exceptionally creative and lovely and I want to use this in a hat but I haven't had the time to make any straw hats yet. That's on my to-do list for the next couple of months is to just get through a lot of straws. And on the inside... I flip it over it's got her label so tricky by edna wallace and in my video i actually found the address of her business and went and visited it it's currently an art gallery but um go and have a look at that video once the stream is over i i really enjoyed making that video and then on the inside i have the lining which i um washed and reused because i didn't want to create my own lining because i hate making linings and then my only addition, so normally I wouldn't, it, the hat was perfect, but personally the way I wear my hair, I prefer to have a cone, uh, a comb inside hats like this because I just think it's, it's just that extra bit of added security that holds the hat down onto the hair. So I've got a comb here that's bound in, in velvet, which is what I like to do to make the cone, comb easier to sew on. So I recommend if you're putting in combs, bind it in something it doesn't even have to be velvet I just like velvet because I like the feel of it and I like the feel of it against my hair but you can use a piece of Petersham ribbon to bind the top or a piece of bias binding cotton anything really anything works um spoken about the lining and then on the inside of this hat which I can't show you because it's all stitched in but I have a bit of video footage of what's on the inside of this hat so let me share my screen here is a little bit of video footage of what's on the inside of this hat. Let me just play it. So, can you see that? Look at what that material is. <laughs> can you guys guess what that inside of that material was? Let me rewind back a bit and show you again. In fact, let's just slow it down a little bit so that you get to see it more. Let's play that back. Pay close attention to what what this material over here is. What's this on the inside of the straw? Let me stop the screen share. So, yes, Sherry, it is blocking net. Now, this was a revelation to me when I um, took apart this hat. I had no idea that it was going to have the blocking net in it. So um, in case you didn't see very well in that video, it's this stuff. This is the blocking net from the beginning of the stream, from, last, from the last stream, from my turbans video. I've tried to make this myself. We've already spoken about um, blocking net uh, factories closing down, but it is blocking net. Um, it's slightly thicker than this one. This one is very, very fine. The blocking net in the other one is a thicker, is a thicker strand and a diagonal weave, uh, a, a diamond pattern even, whereas this is a hexagonal pattern, but it is blocking net. And you might think to yourself, why bother 
putting blocking net underneath straw. Well, straw has a weird tendency, and um, this 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 isn't kind of anything new or anything old, or it's it, it's just how straw is. Because of the way stiffeners work, chemical stiffeners, and even not chemical stiffeners, straw reacts in a funny way to chemical stiffeners. Um, so what I've noticed is, is that when I cover a felt hood in a chemical stiffener, the chemical stiffener gets absorbed into the felt, and then you steam it and it activates it, and that's how it becomes stiff, and it's inside the fibres. With straw, because straw is quite shiny and it's plaited, it's woven, there's nowhere for that chemical stiffener to go into. There's nowhere for it to seep into. So it's going to sit on the surface and you can either choose to block your straw and cover the top of it in stiffener, which can result in a bit of shininess, or you can try and stiffen your um, your straw hood on the inside by painting it on and then blocking it, and then you kind of risk most of that chemical stiffener coming off onto your cling film on your block um, because you've steamed it and the stiffener has just kind of gone and dribbled down. So, yeah. So straw and stiffener just... And be that PVA stiffener or chemical stiffener, it, it's just always going to sit on the surface that you paint it on. So if you don't want to have a shiny straw hat and you don't want to risk having a not very stiff straw hat, you would create a blocking net foundation for your straw and then block the straw over the top of that, over the blocking net. And that's going to give you that extra little bit of stability. In fact, I actually tried this in a hat that um, I was working on and then I just kind of got depressed about it and I left it in a cupboard. So maybe um, if my husband is available to come and get that hat, I should have prepped it out of the cupboard. It's it's in the living room if you'd like to come and get it for me, husband, so I can show everyone blocking net on the underside of a straw and how that works. <laughs> it's in that cupboard there in the bottom. And I'll tell you which box it's in. It is... Uh, that black hat box that you bought me flowers in. Yep, just that whole box. Just give me that whole box. Oh, thank you. Okay, so let me show you close up what I mean about blocking net and straw. Here is the hat. This may never be released as a video, I'm afraid, just because I got a bit depressed about this design. But um, we don't have to look at the design, we'll just look at the um, what's going on here. This is some straw. Uh, this is what parasizal looks like, so it's got these four lines and then it, it weaves. What you can definitely see is this is a, a, mo a more modern parasizal and this is a vintage parasizal. In fact, this might even be called parabuntal. And parabuntal is when it's even finer and you definitely can't get it anymore because the way parabuntal used to be woven is um, by small children. And um, for obvious reasons, that is not ethical. So we don't get parabuntal anymore. And frankly, in this case, thank goodness that we don't get parabuntal anymore because I would not be comfortable working with materials that have been woven using child labor. So anyway, that's that's the size difference, but um, the weave in itself is the same. You get these kind of little um, kind of chevrons in it, and that's how you know it's para uh, para size, also para two a two times weave. But anyway, that's the straw, and then on the other side, underside here, I've got some um, blocking net. What you <laughs> you can see, I kind of ran out because I was using scraps of my um, stash that I had. And this is a dyed blocking net. I dyed it the same colour as the hat so that it would blend in. But you can still see it, obviously. So um, this is a bit without it. This is a bit with it. And if I just push in with my finger, look at how much that pushes in there at the side. And then I'm going to do the same over here. You can see I'm pushing in. You can see it moving. But it's nowhere near as flexible as this straw. So that's what blocking net does when you use it with straw, which I think is fantastic because... Sometimes you want a really stiff straw hat. So there we go. That's that one. 
And if you want to learn more about this particular hat by Edna Wallace, go and have a look at my video. <laughs> Once the stream is done. <laughs> so my last straw hat, I don't have very many straw hats. Um, I think I don't tend to wear straw hats that much, even though I really like them. So my aim for the next year is to build up a more of a straw hat collection for myself, but also for sale, but mainly for myself. So I've got this little straw hat. Now I like to wear this straw hat when I go on holiday because it travels really well. It's tiny. I can just pop it on my head and it doesn't get in my way. It's kind of head sized, but not really. It's just very easy to wear. It goes with everything. So this is one of those vintage hats. So we were having the conversation earlier about does a callow half hat work with jeans and a t-shirt? Well, this does um, because I've worn it to go down to the park and play some badminton. I've also worn it to go into central London and have a walk in a fancy dress walking around Trafalgar Square. Um, I just really love this shape. I think it's great. I've taken it on many dance holidays with me. So when I used to go dancing, when we used to travel, um, I would take this with me. And then I'd be wearing it to and from venues, just to, uh, going around touristy places. I wouldn't wear it while dancing, although I'm sure it would probably stay on my head if I did. It's quite it's quite sturdy. Um, and what this is, this isn't a, um, a straw like, th this isn't sisal. This is, I think this is Rossello. I'm not actually too sure what Rossello is, but it does feel a bit kind of plasticky, like a kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of um, wood pulpy viscosy. I, yeah, I don't think this is a plasticky one. Um, Megan says, I stand corrected, definitely would work with jeans. My vision was rather limited. <laughs> well, I don't know if, if, if the callow half hat is going to wear with jeans. That's what I'm going to investigate once I finish the stream. <laughs> so, um, this is, I think, called Rossello straw. It's this kind of cellophane-y, um, plasticky looking straw. Um, I'm, I haven't had time to do research into exactly what this is, but... Here's what I like about this hat. Oh, let's talk about what it looks like and then I'll tell you what I like about this hat. This kind of um, a, a crown, where it's kind of got a little dip and then the crown and then, mm, this is called a pork pie crown. So it just goes in and out because it looks like a pork pie, apparently. I don't think it looks like a pork pie because the pork pies you get today don't tend to have this kind of shape, but apparently this is what it's called. And then it's got this, um, silk chiffon band, although it could be, it, it could be a not silk, I don't actually know. I haven't tested it because this is a, what I call a fully working hat. I wear it all the time. I don't intend to take it apart. I have refurbished it though. So if I turn it over, I had to put in a new um, ribbon because it was, it used to have a white ribbon and it was completely covered in sweat and makeup stains and it this had obviously been a loved and worn hat um so the ribbon needed changing and i've changed it into two colors of ribbon because this is before i had a big collection of ribbons in my stash and i just used some leftovers because it's a hat for me i don't really mind what the inside is and you might ask why does it even need a ribbon well it's because when you wear a hat you will sweat and you don't want that sweat to go onto the straw you want that sweat to go onto the ribbon because someone can come along and completely take the ribbon off and put in a new one. That's how we keep hats going for years and years and years and decades. Um, I don't know how old this hat is. I think it's probably late 50s, um, early 60s, just going by the shape. And the other refurbishment I did was this didn't used to have an elastic, but I've put an elastic in, although this looks like it's an elastic that's completely disintegrated and gone. It's really flimsy. It's, it doesn't do anything anymore. I should probably take it out. In fact, let's take it out now. This is a pronged elastic. So the pluses of a pronged elastic is you just poke it through the weave and it doesn't damage the hat. There we go. Just poking it through. Oh, although that's caught itself under something. Let me try and Poke that back under. 
There we go. I'm just going to remove this elastic. I will probably put in a new elastic later. This hat doesn't technically need the elastic, but I think when I was playing badminton in the hat, I decided that I should put the elastic in. <laughs> there we go. Right. That's a that's a spent bit of elastic. Um here okay. This is my favourite discovery about this hat. If I peel back this ribbon, you will notice that the edge of the, the straw is reinforced with something that I think is a, um, like a hessian or a linen um, buckram. This isn't white buckram, it's not cotton buckram, it's much stiffer. It's, it's kind of more like the kind of buckram that you'd use for making furniture or making like, um, uh, what are they called? The things you put on curtains, the valances or whatever they're called, those things. This is kind of upholstery buckram, but it's really stiff and it holds the shape really well. And what I really like about this is that in my mind, the default would have been, oh, let's put in a wire. But a wire would have made this hat exceptionally stiff, whereas with the um, the really stiff linen or hessian buckram, it's still really flexible. You wouldn't be able to have this flexibility with the wire. The wire would have made it rigid, the wire would have made it heavy. This hat is super light. This is why it's really good to travel with. So sometimes you don't need a wire, you just need a bit of just something extra to give it some shape um so yeah when working with straw maybe try something else that's not wire something that's just a bit stiffer the other thing about this hat is the way it's been blocked this has definitely been blocked on a very special block on something that uh, on a kind of on something that i would call a double-sided block so because of this fold that goes under all that way it's it's been blocked on something where the block made it possible to do that. And I think it was something like this block over here. This is a vintage hat block that I recently um, bought for £45. And it's here. You can see that that's kind of what this Rosello hat is. Is It would have gone... It would have been blocked over this way and then underneath and over this way and you can see in this block evidence of pins on the underside on the underside of the brim um and not on the overside there but by the by the crown pin marks so this is the kind of block i think this kind of hat would have been blocked on so um that's fun that's all my straw hats very easy to wear especially this one but we can now move on to my one and only vintage felt hat i'm not a massive fan of felt hats i just find them a bit weird to wear like i don't know seasonally speaking you'd kind of think of felt as like a winter hat or maybe it's not a winter hat maybe it's a spring hat maybe it's an autumn hat i don't know i, I find felt um difficult to wear a lot of people feel the opposite a lot of people find felt easy to wear right let's have a look at this hat this hat is rather special um so there's there's two ways you can wear this hat so once again you know how i say um you know don't be a slave to the block make the block work for you i feel the same about hats in general um who is anyone to dictate to me what is the front or back of a hat? I will wear the hat however I want. So technically, <laughs> this is the back of this hat. The um, designer of this hat, Madame Paulette, would have preferred me to put this at the back. But I think that looks a bit weird. I like the fact that um, this has given me some height in the, in the front. This is also known as a skull, skull cap shape so you can see it here so technically this should have been the front and i think it would have been kind of worn like this what do you guys think front or back which way would you have worn it so i think this is the intentional way of wearing it but i prefer it 
the other way. So um, if I change the camera view, I'll show you how I know all this. So I have refurbished this hat. This hat on the top, beautiful condition. Look at this, it's got these little pearls, it's got these little crystals. Are they AB crystals? Yes, they're kind of AB crystals. And I'll talk about the crystals in a second. I love crystals, I've got some here to show you. Um, and then it's got this kind of Lurex um, honeycomb net over the top of it as well, which is absolutely lovely. This is definitely a hat from the um, mid to late 50s. Michael says, backwards is best, you're right. I know, <laughs> thank you. Um, but again, that kind of shows that when you buy a hat or you buy a hat block, don't limit yourself to what you think is the intended way to use something. Like, turn it around, put it on its side, try it in other ways. It, you know, you, you've you bought this hat, you've bought this hat block, it's your object now, you have the right to use it in however way you want. It doesn't matter if it's technically correct. Um, Shari says, depends on the day or my hair, but I like the back as the front better. And Louisa says, definitely back. You see? There we go. So, let's turn it over and have a look at how I know what was meant to be the front and back. So, firstly, there was no comb in this hat. This is um, my addition to the hat. Um, yes. Uh, this label was sewn where this comb currently is. That's how I knew that that was supposed to be the back, because the label does tend to generally be put onto the back of a hat. Um, and then I've also added in an elastic because I usually wear this hat not with my hair down but with a bun and then I like to take this elastic and wrap it around the bun to really anchor the hat on my head because I have worn this hat dancing. In fact there's a video of me dancing wearing this hat. Um, Matthew, if you find on our dance channel the video of you and me at the Spiegel tent where I'm wearing a black dress and I think we're dancing boogie woogie, I think or very fast Balboa. Post that into the chat. I think people will um, find it interesting to have a look at how this hat moves when it's on the head, or rather doesn't move because I've really anchored it down using this and the comb at the front. Now this comb isn't covered in anything because this is before I figured out that it was much easier to sew a comb in if you bind the comb in something. So like I had done in the Edna Wallace hat. This is a comb bound in a piece of velvet. If I was to re-refurbish this, I would take this off, bind the comb in something, maybe just a Petersham ribbon and um, put it back in. In fact, what I would really like to do is change this Petersham ribbon. Look at how grubby this is. Oh, this has been a well-loved hat and it was this grubby before I got it. So I would like to change this. And in fact, I've bought some vintage Petersham ribbon, which I think would be perfect to put into this vintage hat so that I'm kind of keeping the materials from the same decades. And this is where the hat, who the hat is by. So Madame Paulette. So Madame Paulette was quite a famous milliner from Paris. In fact, I have a book on her. Let me show you my book on Madame Paulette. I haven't read this book yet. I bought it because I want to read it. And I haven't had the time. Oh, it's stuck. Here is my book. So this is Hats by Madame Paulette, Paris Milliner Extraordinaire by Annie Schneider and forward by Stephen Jones, published by Thames and Hudson. So I don't know whether I can recommend this book yet because I haven't read it, but um, maybe if you've read it, let me know. It's really beautiful. She was known for her turbans more than anything else. But these turbans are kind of from the um, mid 40s onwards. So that's that's all of these are older works by her. So this kind of thing. So this says 1942, this turban. Oh, that's quite a famous image of um, the model Jean Shrimpton wearing a horsehair hat from 1963. Let's see if I can find some kind of 50s looking hats. Oh look, she's uh, Audrey Hepburn wearing the... Um... Oh, so Madame Paulette made these. Oh, you can't quite see them. There we go. From My Fair Lady. 
So based on drawings by Cecil Beaton, but apparently Madame Paulette made them. So that's one of those cases where the designer is actually different to the maker. And I, I would like it if they credited makers more in, in film and movie credits, because I'm, I'm actually interested in... I, I want to know more about who made the hat rather than who designed it, but that maybe that's just me. Oh, look, there's some... Um, I think that's maybe some Rosello braid, or maybe it's just tiny bows in that one. So, some exciting hats here. Oh, this one's quite similar to this shape, where she's using some pearls on the edge over here. There's another skull cap there with some more diamantes. Clearly something that Madame Paulette enjoyed working with. So, um, let's talk about these crystals then. Oh, actually, no, no. Before we talk about the crystals, let's finish talking about the actual hat. So what's interesting about this one? I mean, yes, it's got a wire here. And I love how the wire is joined. Look at this. Can you guys, let me zoom in. This isn't the best. I should have maybe used a different lens today. But look at this. This is joined using these absolutely delicate crisscrosses. Isn't that amazing? What fine work. And this is a very fine wire. wire. This is... Definitely less than a one millimeter wire. I normally wear, um, I normally use a one millimeter millinery wire, and this is thinner than that. Maybe this is 0 0.8 millimeters. Um, there it is. So it's going, it's going all the way around there. It's going underneath here. The uh, Lurex netting is kind of is trapped under the Petersham ribbon, and then these wonderful folded and draped bits of felt they're held in place with some stitches on the inside this is definitely done by machine this is a this is a chain stitching machine so you can always tell when it's chain stitching because it's got two threads on the back and a single thread on the front that's how you know it's chain stitching and i think this would have been kind of shaped and molded by hand and this is a very special type of felt um, I think this is um, rabbit fur felt, but it's also known as tissue felt. And tissue felt is very, very thin. Look at how thin this felt is. This is a lot thinner than modern felts. It would be very difficult to find a modern felt in this thinness. And what this kind of thin felt allows you to do is it allows you to get these drapes in by hand because it's so moldable. I have worked with a tissue felt once before um, during a class I did and that's the only time I've worked with a tissue felt and I would love to find it again. It's just like butter. So if you think of working with um, uh, fur felt, modern fur felt, and you think that's really pliable and easy to use, this is even more so. Anyway, and then it's got this knot here, which would have been very easy to do out of the tissue felt because it's just so thin. But it still holds its shape beautifully. And what I really love is that it's stamped here by the felt maker. So it says, fur felt, body by Mallory. Oh, and it's got cat hair on the inside. <laughs> because everything I own is covered in cat hair. But um, that would have been a vintage factory that produced this felt and then stamped their maker's mark. And then Madame Paulette would have put in her label. But in fact, this actually says Authentic Reproduction Paulette by Les Serre. Les um, I think that's how you would pronounce that. Please excuse my French. I have to really warm up to do proper French and my throat is just, is just not up to it at the moment. I can't get those R's going properly. Um, so what this would have been is this would have potentially, I think this is how this would have worked. Again, I'm speculating because um, I don't quite... I'm, I'm not so confident in, in this kind of history, but I'm speculating this would have happened by piecing together bits of knowledge I've heard here and there, is that this would have been designed by Madame Paulette, and then the design could have been licensed for reproduction to Les Serres, and then they would have manufactured and sold the hat with Madame Paulette's permission, hence why her name is in the label. Um, so that's an interesting piece of hat history here. Let's talk a bit about these crystals. Um, oh, 
Uh, Megan says, the shape of the Madame Paulette felt hat is all through the 1945 counter pattern catalogue Olivia the Closet Historian reviewed this week. Okay, um, I will look into that. And Megan also says, worn with the bow at the back. Oh, really? Ah, 1945. Okay, so I think what you mean is this actual hat model, right? Okay, I'm really going to have to look into that. That's exciting. Um, <laughs> I mean, you could you could share my uh, my live stream with um, the closet historian and tell her that I have the actual hat. <laughs> um, let's talk about the crystals. So I really like crystals. Um, there's lots of different types of crystals. So let me take you through some types of crystals. And then I think it'll be the end of the live stream. So these are crystals by um, Precocia. These are SS20 crystals. Um, so these are just plain crystals. They do not reflect light in any way other than just reflecting light. I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. I'll just take a couple out. And then I'll try not to confuse them with all the other ones. So SS20 is the size. Here are these crystals. So as you can see, rather plain. They're reflecting some light. They're reflecting some bits of rainbow colour, which isn't really coming across on the camera. Let's see, will that focus? Please focus. No. Nope. There we go. So here are these crystals. They're not really re reflecting much light. Let's compare these to something called AB crystals. I'm going to try and not confuse them. Uh, so let's go for some more uh, Precocia crystals. Oh, now that I've changed the focus. Precocia crystals, also SS20, but these are AB. Now, AB stands for Aurora Borealis, which are the Northern Lights. And the difference between the plain crystals and the AB crystals, whoops, is that these ones reflect the rainbow. Now, different companies of crystal manufacturers will have a slightly different type of AB reflection. So these ones, I would say, kind of lean more on the purple blue side. Here they are. Does that come across in the camera? look at how much more shiny they are compared to the plain crystals. So on my Madame Paulette hat over here, I think they're using plain crystals and every now and again, one of these crystals falls off and I just replace it with one of these modern ones. Um, but you can, I, I think you can see the difference there. No, let's try again. There we go. Can you see the, oh, it's not really coming across in the camera. Oh, that's a shame you guys aren't here live at my studio, in my studio, looking over my shoulder, because the difference that I see in these crystals is is really, like, a lot. Um, if I was to describe it, these just look a bit silver, and then these just look magical and mystical, and when I move my hand around, they're shifting colour, they're almost iridescent. Um, is like this, they're kind of reflecting blues and purples. And then when I go like this, they start reflecting greens and um, blues and a bit of yellow there, like that. So those are different types of crystals. And what have I got here? These are, ah, and these are Swarovski crystals. So this is what I mean by different, um, let's try and refocus that camera. There we go. Different companies of crystals uh, will have slightly different reflections. So, these are also SS20, but they are Swarovski. And these are Precocia. I think that's how you pronounce it. So let me open the Swarovski crystals and show you the difference between a Swarovski AB and a Precocia AB. And if you're wondering why I know so much about crystals, it's because I used to be a dancer. <laughs> oh, husband, could you bring me from the dance shoe drawer in the main bedroom um, can you bring me the yellow shoes covered in crystals, please? So let me try and not m mix these up. This is this is the Swarovski. Okay, everybody remind me that uh, the Swarovski crystals, whoopsie, are on this side of my hand. I'm just going to move them all over here. 
And they're also, I think, a slightly different shape. So even though they are SS20, thank you, just pop them here. And I'll show you my crystal shoes in a second. So, um, these are the Swarovski and these are the Precocia. So, um, Anne says, hi, I think they are pronounced like Preciosa. They're used on ballroom dresses and gowns. They are like Swarovski and um, have all, uh, are almost as posh. Oh, so Preciosa, not Precocia. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, yes, they are used on ballroom things and on shoes. And I'm about to show you a pair of dance shoes that I've got. Slightly different shape here. This is, I don't know if this is going to come across. But the point on this crystal is slightly... Um, smaller than the point on the uh on on the preciosa precocia oh dear i don't know <laughs> um right i'm going to try and not confuse these crystals i think we've looked at crystals enough let's look at them in action is this the only hat i have with crystals i think it might be oh no i made a hat with these crystals but i don't know where it is so we won't look at my hat but we will look at some shoes. Um, please forgive the grubbiness of the shoes because these are old. But this is a pair of my dance shoes. And this has got Swarovski crystals on it. Which were actually repurposed off of a dance dress. And I don't know if the camera is going to put across how shiny they are. So there you go. You can use the crystals on the hats. You can use the crystals on the shoes. Um, these shoes were actually painted in leather paint. And then I put some crystals on them. For dancing and then obviously one has fallen off um because it just yeah the glue i used probably although no i used e6000 glue ah actually let's talk about crystal application you also get something known as um hot fix crystals or just uh plain back crystals so hot fix is where you need like a special pen that heats up and it melts the glue that's already pre-applied to a crystal and then you put it on something and it's there forever. That's one way of doing it, but you have to have this special pen. Or you can apply them using a glue called E6000, which is made for applying crystals. And I prefer the glue method because I just don't want to have a pen around. So when I need to attach crystals to this hat when they start falling off, I um, just use the E6000 glue and stick them on, but it takes ages to dry. So you've got to be very patient. I get a toothpick and I get my glue. I stick my toothpick into the end of the glue. I apply the glue to the back of the crystal. Then I stick the, the crystal to the felt and then I have to leave it and walk away. Leave it for about 24 hours just to be sure that it's definitely glued on. Right, we're almost coming up to the end of the stream. Maybe there's just a little bit of time for some extra hats. Just two more hats. I'm just going to try and clear some space. Take the crystals away. And then I should put them away later. Let's look at my last two hats. Anne says, Rumour has it that Swarovski are stopping making flatbacks, so Precocia will be the new standard. By the way, I'm an active ballroom standard dancer. Oh, very nice. Um, hmm. I also heard rumours that Swarovski were going to stop selling crystals to um, like non-wholesale people because they don't like the fact that people were using them to decorate t-shirts and things. For some reason, I, I heard that a few years ago, but I don't know if that's become true. But I've actually realised that I prefer Precocia crystals anyway. So, who needs Swarovski? <laughs> oh, pre Preciosa. Right, okay, right. I've got it now, I think. Preciosa. Anne says S sound, not K. Okay, Preciosa. <laughs> right, we'll move away from the crystals now. I'll, I'll stop trying to pronounce things I don't know how to pronounce. So, um, here's one of the last hats. Now, it does have fur on it. Um, I don't have time to go into a long discussion about fur. Um, but this is a vintage fur hat. So, uh, this is probably mink. 
and it's on top of a uh, velvet um, hat that is probably um, made on a buckram or a spa tree base. Shall we have a look at the inside? Now that you've seen the shape, it's wonderful. I would like to remake this hat and um, to kind of learn about how this shape is achieved. And for that, I am currently in the process of trying to create my own block. And once I figure it out, I might make a video on it. So what I like about the shape of this hat is it's kind of got this um, volume at the front that um, it's almost similar to that 1940s hat I showed you at the beginning of the stream, the green velvet one. This has got that same thing, but it's definitely blocked on a different kind of block. It's not blocked in two parts. It's, it's all one hat. I don't feel any join. Oh, I was going to say I don't feel any join in there. And then I've just felt a join through the lining. <laughs> now, is that a join in the lining or is that a break in the straw? I'm just trying to feel under the lining. Ah, uh, no, I think that. OK, yeah, no, there's no join. There's no join between the top part and the back. I think that is um, a, um, a break in the hat itself. Um, Rachel from La Bricoluse says, Swarovski are stopping selling to retailers. They're only going to produce crystals for luxury couture production. Well, fine. Who needs Swarovski? We've got Preciosa. <laughs> and as Shari says, it sounds like a casted spell. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the spell of making things sparkle. Anyway, let's, let's get on to the last two hats and then I will go and try on hats with jeans and t-shirts and post it to my Instagram stories. So what I like about this hat is this interesting cutout at the back, um, which I think is very exciting. Uh, so this again goes back to the point of, um, I don't think this block would have had this cut out. The designer of this hat would have blocked this hat and gone, I know, let's make the shape a bit more interesting and cut out the back. And what I love about this cutout in the back is it accommodates a bun. And I really like to wear my hair um, in a bun and it's nice to have a space to put the bun in the hat incorporated into it. So I really like that. And once again, this is covered in velvet and it does feel like that same kind of thick velvet. It's, I think it's silk because it is reflecting some light. You can see there in the lamps, it's reflecting it and it feels very stiff. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's that same kind of vintage velvet backed in that stiffer fabric, like a cotton or something. Um, more research needs to be done. So that's this hat. I think it's very sweet. It's in, the one drawback of this is it's got a spot of glue here. Um, but I think this is possibly where a label would have been glued in. But when I bought this hat, there was no label here. So I don't know who made it. I don't know anything about it. Um, and this is the last hat I've got for you today. And this will kind of bring me into the topic of the video I'm planning to release next week, which will be about wireframe hats. So this is a wireframe hat. If I turn it over, you can see here, it's got this wire skeleton over here. And that's what is forming the shape of this hat. So no, um, no buckram, nothing. It's all being held by wire that's covered in a very thick satin bias binding that's been stitched together there. Um, and the decorative fur, which I think is mink, is sitting on some very stiff felt, I think. Um, or, oh wait, no, what am I talking about? Oh yes, no, it is, it is. There's something here, I think it's some felt holding the fur on the top and then it's got these satin bows covering um, just a few bits of the wire skeleton that you can still see. Um, now this hat is a refurbished vintage hat it wasn't refurbished by me it was refurbished by the milliner who I bought this from and she told me that she bought this hat in Chicago so this is a hat all the way from America and it has this veiling on it, which the milliner who I bought it from said um, it had some silk veiling on it and it um, had completely disintegrated. So she replaced it. But I'm actually tempted to take the veiling off because I'm I'm not sure about veiling. I don't feel too comfortable wearing veiling. Let me pop this on my head. So it, this would sit like this. I just 
I mean, it needs a bit of a steam to shape it because it's been in in a box, in a hat box for a bit of time. But I'm I'm not a fan of veiling. What do you guys think? I just don't think veiling suits me. Like I love the shape of the hat, and I love how it looks from the back. Let me show you. I love the bows, but I just don't like the veiling. So if I put the veiling away, if I kind of tuck it in underneath. I think it looks better on me without the veiling. Maybe it doesn't look as special, but I, I think it's special. It makes me feel a bit special. This is the kind of hat that I like to wear for an evening at the theatre because it doesn't have too much height, it doesn't have too much width. So if someone's sitting behind me, they can still look forwards. And I'm also quite short. If I was really tall, I probably wouldn't want to wear any hat to a theatre, but because I'm below average height, I think, um, even my younger sister is taller than me. Um, I can get away with hats like this with just a little bit of tiny height and I can, I think I can still get away with wearing them at the theatre. So, um, that's all the hats for today. Um, let me see what, um, you've all been chatting about. Oh, you've all been chatting about crystals. Um... Rachel says they've told all the buyers for theatre costume production houses that we can't get them even in bulk anymore. Um, and then Rachel, you said that's a beautiful hat. I think that was referring to this hat right here. Um, and then Anne said, thank you. I think the girls at the studio will appreciate the info. Yes, I'm guessing at your dance studio. Yes. Um, and Rachel says, you're welcome. My manager is looking for what the best new source for flatback rhinestones will be. And I will report back once that's been determined. I think Anne was saying that Preciosa um, was was pretty good for flatbacks. So um, we were talking about that, I think, just before you joined, Rachel. Um, but that's all my vintage hats, guys. Whew. I think we've managed to fit all this in into just over two hours, so perfect. <laughs> My throat is just about still intact. I hope you guys have enjoyed today's stream. <laughs> I've definitely enjoyed showing you my um, collection of vintage hats. Um, is this is this maybe streams like this? Is this something you guys are interested in? In just looking at the kind of hats that I have? Um, I mean, this is literally all the vintage hats I have, but maybe we can have a look at um, some older hats that I've made. Maybe some hats that I made first on my millinery journey and how I would maybe, I could talk about how I would remake them if I was to make them again with the knowledge that I have now, five years on. <laughs> I don't know if that sounds interesting to you guys. But um, other than that, um, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm sure you guys all know by now, but you can follow me on Instagram at Bialona Millinery. Um, I appreciate all your help and all your support. And if you'd like to support me some more, then I have made a Patreon account where there are um, some um, benefits. There's two tiers. There's a, uh, a berry hat tier and a cocktail hat tier. And all the links are in the description box if you'd like to check out what um, you can do with my Patreon, then all that's listed um, down there. And if you uh, would still like to support me but Patreon isn't for you, then please consider leaving me a tip on Ko-fi. Um, all your contributions go towards the video production side of things because um, videos are expensive to make. <laughs> but um, I will continue making them because I love sharing information with you guys. Um... <laughs> oh, lovely messages in the chat. Oh, and I, I really like doing the live streams because you guys can communicate with me. So that's fun. Um, so... I think that's everything and I think it's time for me to sign off and go and have my dinner. So thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget to have a look at my Instagram maybe in a couple of hours where I will see if I can put together some modern looking clothes with some vintage hats to um, tie into some of our earlier conversations. Um, and thank you so much for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all your support. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>